ಕೈಗೊಳ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisance, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, I have a screen. Yeah. Uh, you think we will begin? Yeah. Om Atnana Timirandhasya Nananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militham Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimade Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namine Sri Varshabhana Devi Daitaya Kripabdaye Krishna Sambandha Vitnana Daine Prabhave Namaha Madhuryo Jwala Premadhya Sri Rupa Nuka Bhaktida Sri Gauda Karuna Shakti Vigrahaya Namostute Namaste Gauravani Sri Murtaye Dinatarine Rupanuga Virudha Apasidhanda Dwandvaharine. Okay, this is you have to move it, right? Yeah. So we are at the last question. I will begin from the question again. Uh, so the last question is uh idolaters, yeah, from here. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> Professor uh, Suthers, amazed, I have truly been astonished to hear from your holiness these <clears throat> mysteries of the Vaishnava philosophy and their scientific analysis with the most reasonable arguments. I could not even think before that there are there are in the Vaishnava philosophy such excellent solution, corroboration, and elucidation on the pro of the problems of Indian philosophy. There is one other exchange, though as usual, decidedly one-sided, when the professor in the earlier stages of the discussion foolishly tries to challenge and even decry the idea of God as a fish, boar, etc., I include Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur's rather long tour de force on the avatars of God, spiritual evolution of serving mood, etc., just to give some idea of the superhuman genius of an eternally liberated soul 
who has who has bear in mind responded quite spontaneously to the question obviously to any reasonable person from a totally realized and empowered platform professor suthers in the scriptures of india adorable deities have been represented as creatures of the lower creation like fish tortoise boar etc is this approved by the sense of decency of civilized humanity some again are in favor of supporting such representations as allegorical symbols shila saraswati thakur imagination does not find a place in vaishnava philosophy in it or in the shrimad bhagavatam which is the highest scripture for all men in the universe has been described the topmost ontology about god millions of times better than what the most civilized races of hu- humanity 5000 years old say ne ne is 5000 years old ne as old as several millions of eras can conceive of even in imagination the eternal transcendental forms of god that descend or are manifested according to the gradual evolution of the aptitude for offering service by the totally purified soul quite aloof from the al- allegories like unreal things manufactured in the mental fac- factory of man or like imaginary animal deities of the barbarians such as the tiger god serpent god horse god etc the worship of vishnu uh incarnations like fish turtle etc is not fabrication of it is not fabrication of imagination like that of one of the five deities of the henotheists formed out of imagination based on the coinage of set speeches like the image imaginary conception of the forms of brahman as in Pan- panchadasi or the monoistic school the henotheist henotheist do not admit the transcendental personality of godhead the sex of figurative allegories like the theosophist are not real theists cherishing as they do doubt against the personality of god and as such not having faith in realistic truth and for that reason they want to curtail god's omnipotentiality and his transcendental names appearances attributes sports by means of allegorical description the vaishnava philosophy or that of the ever existent religion of india has never supported the atheistic doctrines of such professors of imaginary forms of brahman or figurative allegories it is about the doctrine of pure and real avataravada cult of incarnation that the philosophy of the ever existing indian religion has said as the pure and real doctrine of avatars of fish turtle etc of the vaishnavas is not a kind of imagination of the barbarian taste nor the idolatry of the mayavadins on the basis of their aphorisms of the forms of brahman imagined for the convenience of practice practitioners nor the allegorical descriptions of the psych- psychists so it is not the anthropomorphism or representation of the deity as having human forms as devised by the so called civilized section of the people nor a uh, theory anthrop uh, anthropism that is the representation of one's tutelary deity in a combined man and beast form nor even apotheosis meaning elevating man to the dignity of deities these are respective types of idolatry of the mental speculationist of the inductive school in imitation of maya mada the evil fruit of the indian civilization anthropomorphism was invented in greece and rome and terry uh, terry anthrop anthropism in egypt 
when a new when the new doctrines got access in these countries along with the commodities produced by the indian civilization uh, just give me one minute can you go back a little bit up uh, where i left this was like it is taken from um one second uh, where is it um as they are called by either it is in egypt and where egypt and uh, what other countries greece and roman greece and rome yes, greece and rome okay yes. uh, greece and rome okay understood um based on the imagination of the anthrop anthro anthro phycites like the indian maya vadins who exalted man or beast to the status of god with the attribution of divinity to them called jivas and poor as narayana with the gratification of the senses in the background then the then the mental speculationist of those respective countries adopted the cheap with cheap vitiated indian dogmas and labeling new names on them passed these doctrinal commodities into the form or forum of religious tenets but the true vaishnava philosophy of india never indulged in any such doctrine based on imagination sri chaitanya mahaprabhu has refuted all such imaginative doctrines or idolatries and rejected both anthropomorphism and theory anthrop uh, anthropism he Vouch, he vouchsafed the shastric teachings that he must be a heretic and sinner who looks upon god narayana as equal to the deities like brahma let me pause it for a minute so yeah. you can see that whether it is greek greek or Ro greece or rome or yeah. you know uh, bhakti siddhanta shila bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur is completely familiar with all these kind of uh, uh, versions mm -hmm. or uh, interpretations that the modern civilization presented with regard to um you know creating deities in the form of animals and and it is uh, vaishnavism is none of that it is yeah. you know what yeah so he 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 is he was very well read and he was thorough in his analysis of what these uh, dogmas and what these uh, misbeliefs were uh, and so he could very clearly um he could clearly speak on yeah. this topic or any topic for that matter because he was very well read and yeah. it, it's not even just reading it i, I feel every time i read about him i feel like yeah. it's not his just the intellect it yeah. is because of the quality of his spiritual practice he is yeah. able to communicate at a different level you know it is not about anybody can read greek philosophy or roman or whatever mm. it is you can read and understand but to be able to speak with clarity yeah. and precision you yeah. should have that kind of spiritual knowledge you know that is what is a, 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 the spiritual realization that is what was unique about uh, you know how he is able to communicate so clearly he said uh, heretic or and sinner who looks upon god narayana as equal to deities like brahma he, he could clearly say that on the yeah. face of people don't even go anywhere near that here we see the perceptive acharya readily understanding the misconceptions accumulated by the american professor in his studies of comparative religions thinking that the avatars of vishnu were either to be understood allegorically or as being part of a pagan indian past again see the thing is the the professor's question is more or less pushing us uh, i mean yeah. pushing uh, to to kind of uh, make make anybody think that you know indians are pagan mm. but but actually you know the those others who are concocting these things from various philosophical perspectives they are the pagans not mm. what is described in shrimad bhagavatam as avatars of krishna you know so again this is the climate produced by the indological researches of the british and german scholars and german scholars at that time had studied had gone and taken our vedic scriptures and studied tried to study it thoroughly and but the thing is some of them 
have mis uh, you know uh, misinterpreted it to sila saraswati thakur so sila saraswati thakur is carefully enumerating and discounting any type of allegorical anthropomorphic theory anthropic etc interpretation in relation to avatars or of vishnu so that maybe there are other religions where they uh -huh. they give animal forms to god and or demigods or whatever but when somebody comes to attack avatars of vishnu you know he had real answers for this he mentions some of the bogus ideas of western theorists the theosophical society which considered the stories to be symbolic and not real theosophical society was very well spread in india you know so the, they are more, they were their interpretation is with everything is symbolic it is not real and he noticed who believe in one god but who is ultimately impersonal and he ultimately lays the blame for all these foolish conceptions at the door of the mayavadis whose philosophy he calls the evil fruit of indian civilization interesting who, who call ordinary animals and men narayana and the real background interest of its followers as gratification of senses he then describes this avataravada cult of incarnation as the philosophy of ever existing indian religion this was indeed a surprise for the good professor shila saraswati thakur continues shila saraswati thakur anthropomorphism that is representation of the deity with human form and attributes resembles the tenet of the bauls of bengal attributing divinity to the head of their sect professing as they do though wrongly to have perception perceptorially descended from sri chaitanya mahaprabhu such tenets are the mental imaginations of atheists like buddhist sorry like baudhas followers of buddha and the bauls as above running contrary to the teachings of sri buddha vishnu sri chaitanya uh, sri chaitanya vishnu respectively the mayavadi sect too has uh, adopted similar principles the real the, the really scientific philosophy of shrimad bhagavatam and the preachings of sri chaitanya deva have of course accepted the human body as the divine manifestation shrimad bhagavatam 3212 but the human body is not the criterion of anthropomorphism nor the baul doctrine but it is the eternal satchit ananda body the cause of all causes the highest supportive entity when the human soul can acquire the wealth of all the sciences in perfection then only is opened the door of the foremost mystery of true science when the human soul can acquire the wealth of all the sciences in perfection then only is opened the door of all door of the foremost mystery of true science according to the vaishnava philosophy the supportive manifestation of god is of two kinds one kind is the creation of the material and spiritual universe and its systematization with inviolable rules interesting see one kind is what is it manifestation of god is of two kinds one kind is the creation of the material and spiritual universe and its systematization with inviolable rules rules yeah. so it's it's not like some random creation you know the school of intelligent empiricist can to a certain extent experience this type of god's sportive manifestation the second kind is the descent of god's transcendental sport in this created universe see interesting <laughs> first it is all organized way the material and spiritual worlds are there and then the lord descends uh, for his transcendental sport within this created universe it is the jeevas who are the attendants in his sports they become attached to matter having deviated from their own essential nature as the result of their desire for enjoyment 
But when again the soul of Jiva gains true wisdom of the transcendental region of transcendental region of God at the feet of a representative of his, he begins to get back his pure essential nature gradually unfolded and God's transcendental eternal forms appear as the objects of his worship according to the comprehension of his service in the graded evolution of acceptance of his protection. I would like to read that again. But again, the soul of Jiva gains true wisdom of the transcendental region of God at the feet of a representative of his. So <clears throat> one gains transcendental wisdom from the feet of Guru. Then he begins to get back his pure essential nature gradually unfolded. And God's transcendental eternal forms appear as the objects of his worship according to the comprehension of his service in the greater evolution of acceptance of his protection, self-surrender or theism. So in such a case, there remains no room, even in the slightest degree, for any form of imaginative doctrines of the so-called civilized and or uncivilized human minds. No room for imagination. This is all real. Whether apotheosis, whether apotheosistic, anthropomorphic, henotheistic, terimorphic, or terianthropic, Imagine if you have to expand what all these th theories are, you know, I'm sure it is, it will confuse a, a, any ordinary human being. And, but he, he is very familiar with all these things and we don't even know what it is. The mm -hmm. real, real eternal and transcendental divine forms reveal themselves to the pure souls according to the nature of their serving mood in the revolutionary growth thereof. The only cause of these divine descents in the is the intense mercy of God towards Jeevas. In Europe, the theories of physical evolution of Darwin and La Lamar Lamarck has been considered uh, have been considered, but it is in the Vaishnava philosophy alone that we see the fully scientific and real conception of each eternal and transcendental divine form for worship by the freed souls according to their evolutionary growth of serving mood. According to the evolutionary growth of their serving mood. So real conception of each eternal and transcendental divine form for worship by the freed soul according to their evolutionary growth and serving mood. So according to one's own you know, spiritual growth. I mean, there is an evolution in it and one's transcendental uh, mood also is there. That is when one will have the real conception. Here, Srila Saraswati Thakur shows his ready awareness of the evolutionary theories of Darwin and Lamarck, but explains, you know, he, he, he has clear understanding of this, his awareness, his ready awareness of the evolutionary theory of Darwin and Lamarck, but explains that Real evolution of the jiva is the growth of his serving mood to the Lord. Real evolution of jiva is in the growth of his serving mood to the Lord. He now proceeds to further describe how there are 10 different stages of animal life described by the sages in, of India and that they may, these may be called historical stages of jivas. He then further analyzes that the 10 incarnations of God indicate these different stages of jivas in the evolution of their serving mood. In other words, the Lord appears to attract the conditioned souls to his worship by appearing in all the various stages of animal animate beings. God appears, the Lord appears to attract the conditioned souls to his worship by appearing in all the various stages of animate beings, which the conditioned soul have experienced in their thousands of births. And he does so being aware of the various kinds of serving moods they have developed, which will cause them to be attracted to one of these forms 
This will be described in the next amazing remark, Srila Saraswati Thakur. We can notice the different stages of animal life from the invertebrate, uh, testaceous or shelly vertebrate, um, mm. erectly vertebrate, as in the combined form of man and beast, mannequin, dwarf, barbaric, civilized, wise, ultra-wise, destructive. Interesting. These are the historical stages of the jivas. I don't think any one of us can understand what this really means. You know, it's it's, it's amazing. <laughs> these are the historic. These are the um, according to the what is it? These are the historical stages of jivas. According to the gradation of these stages, as indications of evolution of the serving mood of the jiva soul. There are manifested the ten incarnations of God, Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Nrishinka, Vamana, Parashuram, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, and Kalki, as worshipable deities with ethereal transcendental names, forms, attributes, and sports. Those who have acquired a true knowledge about um, incarnations <clears throat> with a thorough culture thereof will be able with the grace of the philosophers trained in the school of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to appreciate the ontology of Sri Krishna speci speci especially the intense sweetness of his sports at Braja, Vrindavan and the neighborhood. Professor Suthers obviously trying to grasp what he has just heard. I have just listened to many subtle truths in science and philosophy of religion. Please let me have a conception of these intricate matters. The professor had himself undergone an evolution from skeptical and challenging to amazed, impressed, even awed. Practically, he is inquiring at this point like a student. Now see how Srila Saraswati Thakur, the consummate pure preacher, Seeing the professor as a conditioned soul needing to be illumined, illumined uncompromisingly does not spare him the truth regarding the price of such illumination. Srila Saraswati Thakur. The essential principle of Vaishnavism is that howsoever great a scholar and intellectual giant a man may be, he will not be able to appreciate even the easiest points of... Huh, <laughs> the Vaishnava philosophy, until and unless he has entirely surrendered himself to an Acharya. I mean, from the point when he started talking and see the evolution of uh, the description of, uh, you know, uh, the whole philosophy, and now he can straight away tell to the professor that uh, however great one may be, you will never be able to appreciate Vaishnava philosophy until until and unless he has surrendered himself to an Acharya, whose character is embodiment of the Vaishnava philosophy, whose character is the embodiment of Vaishnava philosophy. You must have heard about the Indian scripture named Gita, which has been translated into different languages of the civilized world. There is a slogan, in 4.34, which says that Vaishnava philosophy is understandable only with unconditioned surrender, honest inquiry, and serving temper. Vaishnava philosophy is understood only with unconditioned surrender, honest inquiry, and serving temper. Yeah. It is only to such an approach it is only to such an approach the professor of Vaishnava philosophy with these three as the receptorial fee that they give instructions about the correct philosophical truths. These professors are never to be tempted by any type of worldly fees. Hmm. The professor was unprepared for full surrender though. So again, he changed the subject. However, by the end of the interview, he was just, he was most humble and impressed and told Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, I do not know how fortunate I am to have met your holiness and got spiritually enlightened in this manner. He then traveled to see Lord Chaitanya's birthplace and when leaving India, he spoke to many friends about the incomparability of Srila Saraswati Thakur's contributions 
these excerpts serve to underscore the wonderful scholarship brilliance and transcendental ingenuity of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur as a preacher of the highest philosophy known to mankind. No wonder that the initially proud professor was so flabbergasted at the, by the end of the interview. <laughs> Since <laughs> it's a wonderful. And since we discussed these things, uh, uh, I think we will continue the reading. Mm -hmm. Triumph, Triumph of the Gaudiya Mat. One second, Mataji. Mm -hmm. My document is stuck. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going round and round. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So this is Triumph of the Gaudiya Mud. The following the following years marked an unparalleled rise in the activities of the Gaudiya Mud throughout India and beyond. In the scope of this book, it is possible to note only the high points of these efforts. In 1929, Saraswati Thakur began a program to glorify the holy places sanctified by the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by establishing 108 Padapita memorials of the footprints of the Lord in various places where he traveled and preached. He established one such Padapita at Kanai and one at Mandar in Benares while installing a Padapita uh, he also gave a lecture on the instructions of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Srila Sanatana Goswami on the site of the actual spot where these talks were held. In January 1930, Saraswati Thakur installed the deities of Radha Govinda at the Triveni on the occasion of Purna Kumbha Mela, and he sent out his team of preachers in the area to enlighten people. His preaching work was his preaching work was increasingly more organized. His teams would canvas from door to door, asking for contributions, selling subscriptions to their magazines, starting centers, making devotees, etc. Srila Saraswati Thakur was making lecture tours, talking with intellectuals and scholars of the day, presiding over installations of deities, initiations and festivals organized for diorama, exhibitions, temple openings, prasadam distribution, etc. Meanwhile, his presses were rolling, producing books. He was even meeting with the English governors, viceroys, Indian kings, etc., and encouraging them to assist in the opening of his temples and projects. Of course, this was frowned upon by some of the nationalists and religious purists, but Sri Saraswati Thakur was far uh, far removed from the bodily concept of life. His idea was to involve and purify everyone in the flood of Sankirtana movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, okay. And in February, one second, but Srila Thakur was, was Srila Saraswati Thakur was far removed from the bodily concept of life. His idea was to involve and purify everyone in the flood of the Sankirtana movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In February 1930, a tremendous diorama exhibition called Sri Dham Mayapur Navadvip exhibition was opened in that holy site, which contained many stalls exhibiting the stories and lessons from Srimad Bhagavatam. It created a sensation. Thousands flocked to see it and it remained open for a month and a half. On October 1930, there was a magnificent installation ceremony of Sri Radha Madan Mohan, Radha Govinda and Radha Gopinath at the Gaudiya Mat in Bagh Bazar, Calcutta. A palatial marble temple has been constructed with the help of a wealthy Vaishnava merchant. This was Srila Saraswati Thakur's practical exhibition of the principle of Yukta Vairagya to utilize the material energy for Krishna's purposes. 
Although previously Vaishnavas tended to avoid the cities and live in seclusion, Srila Saraswati Thakur's idea was to have his sannyasi and brahmachari preachers go to the cities and establish temples and tend to the spiritual welfare of the masses. Thus, the small beginnings in Calcutta, number one, Ultanga Junction Road, had culminated in a magnificent ten temple with a conference hall for discourses, many rooms, a library, press, etc. Srila Saraswati Thakur's ideas were considered revolutionary. Sannyasis riding in motor cars, wearing sewn clothes, buying the most modern printing presses, staging huge exhibitions and with dioramas illustrating the profound philosophy of Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. Nothing like it had ever been attempted before. See, that is his boldness. You know, he could okay. revolutionize the whole thing. You know, he never cared what people looked at him when he was wearing Western dresses and approaching Western people. Srila Bhakti Vinoda Thakur had laid the groundwork by reviving interest in Vaishnava thought, establishing its credibility and respectability, publishing the books of the Goswamis of Vrindavan, and also creating his own brilliant transcendental storehouse of Vaishnava literature poetry, songs, and deep philosophical tracks. Now Saraswati Thakur was distributing it, publicizing it, writing books, and creating sensation. His activities were that of an empowered preacher. He preached to the intellectuals all over India, had exhibitions, established many temples, established Pada, Pada Pitas, wrote many books, published magazines, held huge festivals, re-established holy places, installed deities, etc., he burned with the desire to fulfill Lord Chaitanya's mission to spread Krishna consciousness all over, where is it? I cannot find it, all over earth. By years, by years end, he had preached in Jaipur, Kurmakshetra, Simhachal, Kovyur, uh, the site of the meeting and discussion between Ramananda Rai and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In 1931, a school was opened in Mayapur, um, the Thakur Bhaktivinode Institute. At that time, it was the only English medium high school based on spiritual instruction. Srila Saraswati Thakur delivered a lecture called Apara and Para Vidya, Material and Spiritual Education, at the opening. At, at the opening. Deities were established in Alaranath, where years earlier he had entered the the trance of ecstasy and become lost in the forest. He also established deities in New Delhi, the capital of India and the former capital of the Pandavas. He spoke to many scholars like Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld from Germany, Dr. Stella Krum, uh, Krum, what is that? Krumrich, another German scholar who taught in Calcutta University and Mr. A.J. Jacob from America. To all, he taught the importance of hearing the transcendental sound from the transcendental agent. A transcendental sound has got innumerable potencies. It has power of delegating power to us to receive all of it. When it comes from an unknown region, it should first inject such power to our feeble receiving instrument as would enable us to welcome it. We must not so we must not show a challenging or rejecting attitude as we are liable to do towards advice offered gratis. If we are fortunate to receive the sound that is beyond human scope, we should listen to it. God had sent down his messengers in symbolized figures to give us uh, if we are at if we are at all really sanguine ideas of the absolute it's only then that he would enable he would be enabled to make any progress this fortune is denied to all who have love for transcendental things transformable things this fortune is denied to all who have love for transformable things we must yeah. not neglect the transcendental sound freely transmitted by the agent of the absolute. We find ourselves interested in many things that are not known to us. The doctors do not know the remedies of many diseases. We require no momentary 
no we require no monetary value in exchange for transmitting our message we live in a, we live a simple life and require little help from others in the way of scientific facilities as we have got our ear we can receive transcendental sound and vocalize the same to any intelligent person who may hear us this will this will not be accessible to persons who have very little culture who are engrossed in sensuous engagements but we expect the intelligent section to make some preparatory progress towards toward a region of which we are essentially in need in these days of materialism we are no doubt puzzled by these high thoughts we are trying to do much to enrich human intellect but we are startled when we are told to look beyond this is silly we want to rouse up the true mentality of the civilized world for seeking true help towards spiritual progress the secular help cannot appease our inner hunger the tra transcendental help can we intelligent people should receive receive this transcendental sound we are now vitally concerned in this as everyone as everyone is engaged in exploring ways and means for getting rid of our present unbearable inadequacies we should spare a portion of our time to receive those sounds shila bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur shows how much aware he is of the foolish mode of thinking of contemporary society by such phrase as in these days of materialism we are no doubt puzzled by those puzzled by these high thoughts we meaning human society are trying to do much to enrich the human intellect but we are startled when we are told to look beyond this is silly but he also compassionately notes everyone is engaged in exploring ways and means for getting rid of our present unbearable inadequacies then he notes the eternal solution to what is really the eternal problem of conditioned exist conditional existence we should spare a portion of our time to receive these sounds transcendental sound from a liberated soul in november 1931 shri la bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur sent the preachers from his delhi mud with a spiritual message to the um with a spiritual message to the to then viceroy of india lord willington shri la saraswati later delivered some lectures in delhi in the latter part of that year and glorified shrimad bhagavatam at shukar at shukar tala the place where shukadeva goswami delivered bhagavatam to maharaja parikshit 5000 years later earlier earlier sorry in 1932 deities were installed in madras and many well attended discourses were held in the area in mayapur he initiated a series of examinations for the titles of bhakti shastri and acharya in the 10 subject areas shruti or vedas vedanta bhagavata ekayana pancharatra literature history sampradaya vibhava sampradaya vibhava bhakti shastra philosophy and rasa disciples were expected to at least try to achieve bhakti shastri degree and those who were to become expert priests and preachers should, would study puja vedanta philosophy etc for higher degrees we may note that sri la prabhupad also wanted a system of degree courses devised for the study of his books including higher degrees for advanced studies in shrimad bhagavatam and chaitanya charitamrita in may 1932 he revised and corrected the a scholarly english presentation on the life of sri chaitanya mahaprabhu called sri krishna chaitanya which was composed by one of his disciples the work was done in a very thorough way compiling the pastimes of lord from all the prominent biographies of the lord written by his immediate followers especially the chaitanya bhagavata and chaitanya charitamrita um professor sanyal 
was uh, also was the one of the editors of the English Harmonist. Um, geez, somebody keeping on texting that is coming in front of my eyes. Mm. And Chaitanya Charitamrita, Professor Sanyal also was the editor of the English Harmonist, Srila Saraswati Thakur. And being um, pleased with this effort, the Acharya wrote a wonderful introduction to the volume printed in Madras, noting the writer has got the prime object of furnishing a comparative study in which the position of the reader has the highest place. This is his only ambition. This is his, somehow the word are, words are getting covered with the uh, computer screen. Okay. Um, Ach yeah, the, yeah. The, the computer screen is coming here. Acharya wrote a wonderful introduction to the volume printed in Madras, noting the writer has got the prime object of furnishing a comparative study in which the position of a reader has the highest place. This is his only ambition of healing the deprived mentality of the so-called culturists of true knowledge. But the readers, readers have different motives of utilizing the product of their enterprise of pursuing the book, one class of readers are found to criticize the merits and demerits of the writer in order to establish their superiority with a view to puff up their vanity. Another class is observed to muse over the subject by spending their time for gratification of their senses. Third section of the reader may mean to profit by reading the book in order to regulate their life for a better purpose. The underestimation of a desirable element of some utilization through the temporal gratification of the senses would not equipoise the third position of the reader who will surely mark the distinction, distinctive situation by comparing other things and agree with the author in spending his valuable time for true amelior amelioration. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur wants the audience of intellectuals to whom this book has been addressed not to commit the error of trying to fault the author or some intellectual or literary basis to establish their own superiority or to try to examine the contents with a view to gratify their senses with some story. He delineates the proper approach as reading the book in order to regulate their life for a better purpose. What a wonderful thing. Reading the book in order to regulate your life for a better purpose. That's the only reason to read any book. Not any of that about three different categories. And thereby healing the depraved mentality. Sorry. And, there, and thereby healing the depraved mentality of the so-called culturists of true knowledge. Certainly, this is the chopping technique of the pure sadhu at work. Right from the start, he addressed the intellectuals of his day and warns them not to drag any material conception to the region of absolute truth. He continues, the body of the book will appear before the readers as a historical account of the journey of life of a hero. But the hero is not an ordinary mundane hero for a halluc hallucinative ambition with a spiritual tinge. The account will no doubt show that the targeted ob object of the manifestive spiritual world is eternal and identical with the hero of the speaker. Hasty conclusions will be pouring forth. Hasty conclusions will be pouring forth the to oppose this as welcoming anthropomorphic and apotheotic thoughts. The delineation will prove that the object pointed to is beyond the comprehension of crippled senses. And the absolute eternity made up of pure knowledge and incessant bliss is never to be had within the compass of our senses. All objects of the phenomena which are comprehended by senses have temporal situation and deformed entity void of different qualities that are always submissive to the senses. In other words, Lord Chaitanya's activities are of the spiritual world and cannot be comprehended by sensory or intellectual perception because he is the Supreme Lord himself. So 
the the so in in other words transcendental knowledge surpasses everything um the material that we know whether it is gross uh, body related uh, uh, understanding or even if it is subtle which is our subtle body which is uh, mind in, uh, mind intelligence and false ego and one may think that by intellectual analysis one can even understand any of these things but you know uh, obviously you know the understanding about the soul and its relationship with god is um, whether beyond whether it uh, beyond the gross and subtle conceptions that we have and intellect is uh, uh, at that subtle level subtlest one which is close to the soul and one has to even surpass that boundary to to be able to comprehend anything at all about the lord so in uh, other words lord chaitanya's activities are of spiritual world cannot be comprehended by sensory or intellectual perception inspection because he is the supreme lord himself so one one can you know even a, a spiritualist can get stuck at intellectual level uh, and that that is i mean there are different pitfalls in the path of the, the spiritual journey and even to be stuck at the subtle body platform you know one has to be so careful and that's where you know the the beauty of uh, this bhakti yoga practice comes in at the same time he has he has he was editing professor sanyal's book he also checked the proof of his english presentation brahma okay he also checked the proofs of his english presentation of brahma samhita with sanskrit commentary by shila jeeva goswami a book discovered by shri chaitanya mahaprabhu in his travels which perfectly elucidated his teachings about krishna so this was professor sanyal at uh, it looks like who is the one who wrote it mm. uh, yeah so the, but but the english is you know the when i when i when i was when i came across this and then i was reading brahma samhita carefully and when i couldn't understand some of those things at all and um realized later that it was one of his disciples but of course uh, it was bhakti siddhanta who must have read it but i was thinking whether it is professor sanyal or bhakti siddhan that they knew what they were doing and they could uh, they could understand what they were writing there yeah. but but we cannot because yeah. we need a simplified version of all of this to be uh, uh, yeah so that's what one time in maharaj's class you know uh, we had that discussion yeah. so brahma samhita with the sanskrit commentary it was originally they translated it with it which was jeeva goswami's commentary a book discovered by shri chaitanya mahaprabhu in his travels which perfectly elucidated his teachings about krishna when lord chaitanya visited the temple of adi keshava topics with highly advanced devotees there Uh, sorry uh, he discussed some spiritual topics with highly advanced devotees there and while he there while there he found a chapter of brahma samhita actually the book was originally much longer but the fifth chapter was all that remained the incident is uh, described in chaitanya charitamrita madhya leela chapter 9 by his divine grace Esi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhu Pad as follows Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was greatly happy to find a chapter of that scripture and symptoms of ecstatic transformation trembling tears perspiration trance and jubilation were manifest in his body there is no scripture equal to Brahma Samhita as far as the final spiritual conclusion is concerned indeed that scripture is the supreme revelation of the glories of Lord Govinda for it reveals the topmost knowledge about him since all conclusions are briefly presented in brahma samhita it is essential among all the vaishnava literatures text 238 to 240 purport the brahma samhita is a very important scripture shri chaitanya mahaprabhu acquired the fifth chapter from adi keshava temple in the fifth chapter the philosophical conclusion of achindya beda bedya tattva simultaneous oneness and difference is presented 
The chapter also presents methods of devotional service, 18 syllable Vedic hymn, discourse on the soul, the super soul, and fruitive activity, an expand explanation of Kama Gayatri, Kama Bija, and the original Mahavishnu, and the specific description of the spiritual world, specifically Gologa Vrindavan. Brahma Samhita also explains the demigod Ganesha, the Garbhodaka Sai Vishnu, the origin of Gayatri Mantra, the form of Govinda and his transcendental position and abode, the living entities, the highest goal, the goddess Durga, the, the meaning of austerity, the five gross elements, love of Godhead, impersonal Brahman, initiation of Lord Brahma, and the vision of transcendental love enabling one to see the Lord. The steps of devotional service are also explained, the mind Yoga Nidra, the goddess of fortune, devotional service in spontaneous ecstasy, incarnations beginning with Lord Ramachandra, deities, the conditioned soul and its duties, the truth about Lord Vishnu, prayers, Vedic hymns, Lord Shiva, Vedic literature, personalism and impersonalism, good behavior and many other subjects are also discussed. There is also a description of the sun and the universal form of the Lord. All these subjects are conclusively explained in a nutshell in Brahma Samhita. In the same in the same ninth chapter of Madhya Leela, Sri Chaitanya presented Brahma Samhita and Krishna Karnamrita to Ramananda Rai and told him, Whatever you have told me about devotional service is all supported by these two books. From this we can see uh, the importance of Lord Chaitanya importance Lord Chaitanya gave to this scripture and it is further explained that he personally copied it down with his own hand. Lord Ramananda Rai was made a copy. Lord Ramananda Rai made a copy Let and in go. this way it was passed on until Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur published it on a large scale for the first time. During this period, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur completed his Gaudiya Bhashya commentary on Chaitanya Bhagavad and wrote a short English biography called Rai Ramananda. Yes, you want to take it from now, uh, Prabhu? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please uh, bless us something, Mataji. Um, some quick short note or something like Yo, that. There has been, there is so much starting with the Sanyal all the way to. Mm. Uh, it's the spreading of um, uh, philosophy uh, in a Gaudi. Uh, sorry, the uh, the Gaudiya uh, the Gaudiya many Mad. many many yeah. many Gaudiya Mad branches were established everywhere, and his uh, amazing uh, method methods he adopted uh, in preaching and reaching even to the English speaking professors and his unconventional method of preaching and his total disregard for those who didn't care anything at all about him, mm -hmm. you know, know, criticisms. He never even bothered one bit about it. And he carried on with his teachings and preachings and, and then so many other th topics which came up also, which uh, with regard to all his knowledge about uh, uh, Greek and uh, uh -huh. Roman, you know, he was so thorough in all those things. And when uh, in that conversation with that professor, when he was bringing up that uh, the animal, uh, the ten incarnations of the yeah. God is something like what is being described in this Western philosophy, and he completely um, uh, argued clearly explained that it is none of those kind of thoughts that has anything to do with these 10 incarnations of the Lord. And it is, he thoroughly explained it in such a way that if anybody compared the uh, the various, uh, you know, philosophical arguments coming outside of Vaishnava philosophy, they were able to clearly understand that the, the incarnations of the Lord cannot be compared with uh, these imaginations of these uh, brilliant uh, scholarly people who were writing various things about uh, different forms of God in different animals. And all that he was able to smash because of his thorough knowledge about what those writings were. If you don't have yeah. knowledge about that, you cannot argue about this at all. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, so there were so many things that we read today that... Yeah. Um, yeah, but those were, those were some of the some things which mm. I could remember, but sure, there was Mataji. a lot more. Mm. Thank you, Mataji. 
So during this period, Srila Bhakti Dhans Asar Thakur. Uh, by the way, dear devotees, thank you for joining. Whenever you're able to read, please feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, or interrupt in any way. Okay? We'll just go for another 45 minutes and wrap up. So during this period, Srila Bhakti Dhans Asar Thakur completed his Gaudiya Bhashya commentary on the Chaitanya Bhagavata and wrote a short English biography called Rai Ramananda on the account of the life of Srila Ramananda Rai. The later work, Srila Bhaktisdanta, Srila Bhaktisdanta divided it into two parts. The first part, the Lord and his beloved, viewed by empiricists. He describes as a short narrative of the Supreme Lord and Rai Ramananda as gazed by mundane spectators known as hegeolators who search about the accounts of heroes. This first section almost humorously accounts for Ramananda Rai and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in a manner suitable for speculative scholars and historians. The second section is called The Lord and His Beloved, viewed by devotees, which he addresses to those in his audience whom he clearly takes more seriously. On the first page of that chapter, he writes, we have surveyed in the last chapter the seeming conception of the worldly people about Rai Ramananda. Now, we are to enlighten those who are interested in the esoteric aspect of the devotee. Sevens of the spiritual manifestations do not corroborate the view of the ordinary observer of mundane phenomena. Conception is carried both in worldly phenomena as well as transcendental manifesto aspects. A stricter caution may not be neglected in distinguishing the two different planes so as to rescue the true view from confusion. Here we see Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saswat Thakur, Thakur's often repeated theme that the materialistic demeanor cannot possibly stretch to the transcendental autocrat. So there are two distinct planes of existence that of ex 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 exoteric material appearances, which tell us something about spiritual personages, but not much. On the esoteric spiritual plane, which reveals the essence and which is vastly more important and of permanent significance. So this small book is a wonderful display of just how true this principle is. Nothing of Ramananda Rai's char true character can be comprehended by an external view of biographical facts and figures. The only entry into his true glories was, a, was by a transcendental agent like Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saswat Thakur. Hmm. So in June of 1932, he visited the Maharaj of Mysore and stayed as a guest in his Ram Ramya palace, where he delivered a series of discourses about Lord Chaitanya's philosophy. He then preached in Bangalore and then traveled to Kavur, where he installed deities near the transcendental site of the conversations between Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Rai. In October and November of 1932, the circumambulation of Rajamandala was held, accompanied by many thousands of pilgrims. Srila Saraswati Thakur toured all of the sacred places of Krishna's pastimes and engaged constantly in chanting the name and glories of the Lord on the actual sites of the Lord's pastimes. The pilgrimage required massive organization with many tents, a moving kitchen, stage equipment, animals, etc. The pilgrims would rise early, chant, and proceed in a huge procession with Kirtana, accompanying the deity of Lord Chaitanya, a police band, a lead horse, a flag bearer, and allow all of the followers. At night, at night a city of tents would be erected. Kirtana and discourse areas would be set up. Along with the kitchen, there was even a system of guards for the tents. Wow. It's elaborated organization. However, the pilgrimage encountered opposition in the form of the Vrindavan temple proprietors, the caste Goswamis, who objected to Srila Saraswati Thakura's awarding of Brahminical status to those not born in Brahmana families. Although Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Siddhanta had established this practice strictly in accordance with the teachings of Hari Bhakta Vilasa, 
by Srila Sanatan Goswami, who was one of the founding fathers of the present town of Rundavan, still the Panditas did not approve what they, cons what they considered the deviation of giving Brahmana and Sanyasa initiation to members of lower castes. In this regard, Srila Prabhupada wrote an extensive reply to Achy Achyutananda Swami in 1970, explaining some of the background of this controversy. Regarding the validity of the Brahminical status as we accept it, because in the present age there is no observance of the Garbhadana ceremony, even a person born in a Brahmana family is not considered a Brahmana. He is called Drijabandhu or un unqualified son of a Brahmana. Under the circumstances, the conclusion is that the whole population is now Sudra, as it is stated, Kalo Sudra Sambhava. So, for Sudras, there is no initiation according to the Vedic system. But according to Pancharatrika system, initiation is offered to a person who is inclined to take to Krishna consciousness. During my Guru Maharaj's time, even a person was coming from Brahmana family, he was initiated according to the Pancharatrika system, taking him to be a Sudra. So, the birth rate Brahmanism is not applicable at the present moment. The sacred thread inaugurated by, by my Guru Maharaj, according to Pancharatrika system and Hari Bhakti Vilasa, by Shula Sanatana Goswami, must continue. It doesn't matter whether the priestly class can accept it or not. When my Guru Maharaj, Bhaktisiddhan Saspati Goswami Prabhupada, introduced this system, it was protested even by his inner circle of God brothers and friends. Wow. Um, of course, he had actually no God brothers, but there were many disciples of Bhaktisiddhan Thakur who were considered as God brothers who protested against this action of my Guru Maharaj, but he did not care for it. Actually, one who takes to chanting Hare Krishna mantra offenselessly immediately becomes situated transcendentally. And therefore, he had no need of being initiated with a sacred thread. But <clears throat> Guru Maharaj introduced this system, uh, uh, introduced this sacred thread because a Vaishnava was being mistaken as belonging to the material caste. So to accept a Vaishnava in material caste system, is hellish consideration, nara ki buddhi. Therefore, to save the general populace from being offended to a Vaishnava, he persistently introduced this sacred thread ceremony and we must follow his footsteps. The system introduced my guru, by my Guru Maharaj is a chance for all members of the society, scientifically by, based and applied, apart from the exploitative sentiment of birth rate scarce system, to become actually situated on the transcendental platform. Wow, so nice section. Mm. Okay, I'll continue. The Panditas met with Bhaktisiddhan Saswatakur and a discussion took place. Although the Panditas appeared satisfied with the talks, but when the Parikrama reached the seven main temples, the doors were closed. Shopkeepers closed their shops. And some people even threw stones at them. Finally, they reached Kosi. It was at this point of the pilgrimage that Srila Prabhupada met Srila Saraswati Thakur. Uh -huh. Having traveled from Allahabad, and he sat with rapt attention hearing from him, hearing him speak for many hours. And it was at this moment, at this time, that Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur marked him. He likes to hear. He doesn't go away. Hey. <laughs> Hmm. The pilgrimage was untested. I would I, I would like to say something. Mm. Yes, mm. Mataji. So they are telling that Srila Prabhupada met Bhakti Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur at that time when mm. when people were throwing stones at mm. him and the temples were closed because of his revolutionary idea mm. of uh, giving Brahminical Diksha to everyone, right? So based upon Hari Bhakti Vilas. Mm -hmm. But when Prabhupada met him, that was the atmosphere. Uh, but, but you can see how Srila Prabhupada was immediately appreciative of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And normally speaking, you know, uh, average person would think, okay, here is somebody who is being 
you know, exactly. not accept, accepted by these caste people, right? Yeah. But uh, Prabhupada, on the other hand, was deeply attracted to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And not only that, you know, he followed exactly, I mean, all the instructions and he yeah. imp implemented that worldwide. And so his thinking was, uh, you can clearly see, you see, we can appreciate somebody if your thinking aligns with that person. Exactly. And so they were transcendental uh, personalities. Yes, and they, yeah. yeah. That's something to be appreciated. For sure, Mataji. Yeah, yes. As you said, it's a actually a moment of opposition. But Srila Prabhupada went, went with the, the reality anyways. So nice, Mataji. Thank you. So the pilgrimage was unprecedented in scope, almost like a moving city. The 168 mile circumambulation took from the 9th of October to the 11th of November. During the Radha Kunda portion of the tour, a wonderful discourse was delivered by the ecstatic preacher, the personified energy of Sri Chaitanya's mercy, who delivers devotional service, which is enriched with the conjugal love of Radha and Krishna, coming exactly in the line of revelation of Sri Rupa Goswami at the junction of Radha and Shampun on the subject of Sri Upadesha Amrita by Sri Rupa Goswami. A large audience of Brajavasis and Panditas were fortunate enough to hear him speak. At the conclusion of the Parikrama, Srila Sarsvatakur proceeded to Allahabad where he oversees the laying of the foundation stone for, for the Sri Rupa Gaudiyamat in Allahabad. Sir Malcolm Haley, the governor of UP, was on hand for the occasion and personally laid the cornerstone in Srila Sarsvati Thakura's presence. It was there that Srila Prabhupada received first and second initiation from Srila Saraswati Thakur, who was pleased to see him. When he was presented as a candidate for initiation, Srila Saraswati Thakur commented, yes, he likes to hear. He doesn't go away. I have martyred him. I will make him my disciple. <laughs> I will make him my disciple. Shri Saraswati Thakura's preaching was going on in a big way. He had teams of sannyasis and brahmacharyas constantly traveling and teaching and distributing magazines and books, establishing centers, arranging programs, etc. A core of 18 sannyasis were organizing things. His propaganda attracted so many people that Shubhash Chandra Bose, the famous nationalist and a former classmate of Srila Prabhupada's at a Scottish Church's college, met with Srila Bhaktis Dhan Thakur and complained, so many people you have captured. They are doing nothing for nationalism. The reply was, well, for your national propaganda, you require very strong men. But these people are very weak. You can see they are very skinny. So don't put your glance upon them. Let them eat something and chant Hare Krishna. The Srila Prabhupada commented on this incident. In this way, he avoided him. The kind of revolution Srila Saraswati Thakur had in mind could not be appreciated by Mr. Bose. So in January of 1933, a large diorama exhibition was opened in Dhaka, the present capital of Bangladesh. It was then a part of India. Called just, a, just one, one thing. Yeah. This uh, Subhash Chandra Bose um, being classmate of Srila Prabhupada. And mm. look, look how his life uh, change mm -hmm. right he 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 wanted to really raise an army to um fight the british and mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe correct me if i'm wrong i vaguely remember he went to some other country i forgot whether it was burma or somewhere and uh, mm -hmm. he he i mean do you know anything about that like subhash chandra yep. bose yes Mataji. he went to yeah. japan he went to japan, japan. Uh, ah. yes mm -hmm. he also went to germany he, he, and he was trying to raise a national army, right? Like a yeah. like an army of soldiers to attack the British, right? Mm. Yes, yes. And did he, and and what, how did he end up? Did he disappear completely, or something happened to him? Yeah, he disappeared completely, and um, there are, um, I guess, postulations about the Nehru family having kind of somehow. Um, so he died outside of India. That is the that is uh, the understanding, 
Uh, but he disappeared basically it you so, know so just... anyway interesting look uh, bamsidari can you read that one sentence where mm. it was said he when he went to bakti siddhanta uh, uh, what so bakti siddhanta yeah he said something like these are skinny men and mm. you, you should go find somebody else so, well, can you read that can you read well, that for your national propaganda you require mm. very strong men but mm. these people are very weak you mm. can see them they are very skinny so mm. don't put your glance upon them let them eat something and chant hare krishna and proper wow, so, comments mm. proper mm. comments they're saying that in this way he avoided him like you know bakshidan saswata could avoided the boss so it was interesting that uh, subhash chandra bose uh, thought of canvassing this army created by bakti siddhanta for preaching purpose to be recruited to nationalistic <laughs> movement <laughs> interesting <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Yes, Swati. <laughs> in January 1933, a large diorama exhibition was opened in Dhaka, presently the capital city of Bangladesh. It was then a part of India called Sat Shiksha. It featured toys, dolls, etc. And Bhakti Siddhanta gave discourses there for one month to large crowds of learned and respectable people. So a lot has been done. a lot a lot just by our uh, just the previous acharya prashil prabhupad and prabhupad also like he did a lot hmm. so starting the next one chintamani mata you want to take on you in a position to take on for some time sure prabhu yes okay the message is sent to the west after the annual god purnima celebration and circumambulation of shri Navadvi Dham of 1933, Shri Saraswati Thakur resolved to further expand his preaching of Krishna consciousness to Europe, in line with the desires of Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Shri La Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Inspir- inspirationally, on Lord Chaitanya's appearance day, the thick English volume Sri Krishna Chaitanya by his disciple Professor Sanyal was brought out in a beautifully bound edition. On the 18th of March Shila Saraswati Thakur gave instructions to two of his sannyasi disciples and a third disciple in a special meeting in Madras which served as a farewell address the three disciples who were to proceed to Europe on behalf of their guru maharaj were Shripad Bhakti Pradeep Tirth Maharaj a disciple of Bhakti Vinod Thakur and the sannyas disciple of Shila Saraswati Thakur Shripad Bhakti Riday Bond Maharaj and Shri Sambidananda Prabhu. The instructions he gave them form a brilliant essay on the mood and behavior of a preacher in foreign lands. As we read it, it is impossible not to meditate on how Shila Prabhupad perfectly fit the description of the ideal preacher, according to Saraswati Thakur's description. The talk entitled "La Envoy." which means one who is dispatched on a mission a messenger was later published as an essay in the collection collected english writings of shila bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur the happy days has come when we are destined to spread the message of our great master shri chaitanya mahaprabhu to distant corners of the earth the spiritual service to which we are dedicated now has uh, has now passed the bud stage and fully blown into a flower whose aroma we have to carry across the seas with that willingness which characterized shri hanuman when he leapt over the wide ocean with the message of shri ram this extension of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu's spiritual gift to foreign countries is our humble offering at his feet the words of instructions of shri gorash sundar are verily his beautiful body the preachers of his word through the ages are his secondary limbs the teachings of shri gorasundar is his potent weapon and the grace of shri hari himself established in the word of shri chaitanya is his eternal associate therefore for the purpose of truly presenting shri gorasundar the lord of the gorias to the aliens i am addressing these few words of mine to the preachers who are about to proceed to countries beyond india this was very revolutionary 
Traditionally, sannyasis never journeyed across the ocean or rode on conveyances of any sort, as it was considered a type of sense gratification for a true renunciate. However, the consideration here was to deliver the message of Mahaprabhu for the salvation of the suffering world. We find the following great precepts, Mahavakya, in the body of the teaching that has been vows vouchsafed to us by the Supreme Master of all Masters. To chant constantly the discourse of Hari by hearing, sorry, by being, one, extremely more humble than the blade of grass, by being as forbearing as the tree, by seeking no honor for oneself, and four, by offering due honor to all entities is the highest natural function of the unalloyed individual souls, jivas. The lotus feet of my Sri Gurudeva attracted me to his service by his manifestation as the living embodiment of these four great precepts. My friends will be in a position to attract all souls of the world to the footstool of the real truth by purchasing the same unfailing method. Note that Sri Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur is herein exhibiting his humility by referring to his disciples as his friends. The crest jewel of the order of the sannyasis as the triple staff, Sri Prabodhananda Saraswati Goswami Pada has taught the same process to those who assumed the triple triple staff of renunciation in the following words. I say this by holding the straw between my teeth, by falling at your feet and uttering hundreds of humblest, humblest entreaties. All ye good souls, by throwing off everything to a distance, practice love to the feet of Sri Chaitanya, who is so surpassingly beautiful. Sir, yeah. Following in the footsteps of all the former devotees, I am making my submission to them to pursue the identical method of propaganda. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Dev is the supreme teacher of all teachers of this world and the ideal professor of intelligence, ideal possessor of intelligence that is the highest of all. It should be our only duty to constantly chant those words regarding the cleansing of the mirror of the heart of which he speaks in his eight precepts, Shikshashtakam. We are only the bearers of the transcendental word. We shall never in any way hesitate to offer every honor and facility for which they are eligible to all persons of this world. We must pray to all for the boon of aptitude for the service of Krishna. We shall come across many persons in this world possessing an endless variety of characters disposed or hostile to the service of Krishna. But we should not slacken in our loving service of the Lord of our hearts and should offer due honor to all persons. We will have opportunities as we approach different persons in all parts of the world with the vendor's bag of the discourse of Hari, to see a good many sights, to hear much, and to seek to derive much benefit from our experience. May we never forget that all entities of this world are essentially prodigies of the lotus feet of Sri Guru for helping the expansion of his service. May we always remember that they are excellent only if they are prepared to wait with the utmost eagerness on the particle of dust of the lotus feet of my Sri Guru, and that otherwise they are merely the mirage devised by the deluding potency for our ruin. I wish to remind those friends of mine who are proceeding to the West for preaching the words of Sri Chaitanya, the two precepts of my master, Sri Rupa. One, the constant endeavor for cultivating relationship with Krishna of a person who, being free from all mundane affinity, enjoys the entities of this world, having due regard to the, proprietary, to the propriety of each case 
in pursuance of his purpose is called the proper kind of renunciation. The Vairagya. The abnegation, number two, the abnegation by persons desirous of liberation of entities that have an affinity with Hari in considering their mundane nature is termed renunciation possessing little real value. The abnegation by persons desirous of liberation of entities that have an affinity with Hari in considering their mundane nature is termed renunciation possessing little real value. So, yeah, Yukta Vairagya and Falgu Vairagya. Here, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur points out how to avoid temptation by only being interested in those persons who exhibit the inclination to serve the feet of Sri Guru and to practice Yukta Vairagya, not Falgu Vairagya. It is my request to my friends by giving due honor to all persons to follow in their preaching the ideal of Sri Sanatan Goswami Prabhu in his exposition of the aphorism of the Vedanta, this cessation of mundane birth from the transcendental sound, cessation of further births from sound, under the section of result to be achieved, to be found in such shlokas as all glory to the bliss of the name of Murari. Those nations to whom we, you are going for the propagation of the chant of Hari are mounted on the summit of proficiency in all affairs of this world. They are practiced in the exercise of their rational judgment, are endowed with the quality of good manners, should maintain our hope unshaken that they will prove to be the worthiest recipients of the heard transcendental voice if we unlock to them the gates of the natural exhibition of abiding argument and enduring judgment. That was a long sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but but we... that, is a, that, 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 that is actually that contains one very important message, how to preach in the Western world. Repeat that sentence. They are practiced in the exercise of the... Yeah, the Westerners, the Westerners are practiced in the exercise of... Rational judgment and yeah. are endowed with the so, quality of uh, good manners. Yeah, so how do you preach to them? That is what he was saying. Mm. Should maintain our hope unshaken yes. that mm. they will prove to mm. be the worthiest recipients yes. of, uh, of the heard mm. transcendental voice. Hmm. If we unlock to them the gates hmm. of the natural exhibition of abiding argument and enduring judgment. So abiding basically... argument and enduring judgment. <laughs> abiding argument and enduring judgment. What does that really mean? <laughs> I'm sure it means a lot. Hmm. Enduring judgment. Hmm. Continue, continue reading. If we unpack our baggage of the genuine discourse of Hari by relying on the qualities of forbearance, it will certainly receive the garland of welcome from the hearts of na nations gifted with keen intelligence. Hmm. So, yeah, relying on qualities of forbearance. We have not been actuated by any attempt of rivalry or hostility in undertaking this propaganda. This should always be borne in mind. We should call at the door of each and every seeker of the truth, bearing on our heads the baggage of the real truth to be offered to them. It is no business of ours to be... Pro? To be elated or discouraged by the praise or neglect of any person. We must be constantly alive to the duty of enhancing the pleasure of our master by serving him with perfect sincerity. We must not <coughs> look at the world by being weighed down with the mentality that is oppressed with the sense of deficiency or otherwise by the poverty 
or otherwise of the display of worldly erudition, rank, etc., by any particular person. Hmm. This is the state of forgetfulness of our real selves. All persons of this world are really superior to us in every way of our real selves. In so, every way as far as, as, far as, as the world is concerned. All persons of this world are really superior to us in every way as far as this world is concerned. All those matters are not any commodities that are fit to be coveted by us. We are merely beggars with the triple staff of renunciation devoted to the chanting of the words of Sri Chaitanya. We have no more nor any higher desirable object than the pleasure of serving Sri Hari Guru Vaishnavas. We are not the operators of the instrument, but only the instruments. We must always bear this in mind. The triple staff bhikshus are the living mridangas of Sri Chaitanya. We must constantly give forth our music at the lotus feet of Sri Guru. We should practice the function of the peripatetic preacher, Pariv, Pariv, Parivrajaka. Sorry, Parivrajaka, of carrying aloft the victorious banner of the commands of divine Sri Gaurasundar by constant submission to Sri Guru and the Vaishnavas, fixing our eye on the pole star of the heard transcendental voice. We must always bear in mind that we have been initiated in the vow of the peripatetic preacher for the sole purpose of promulgating the heart's desire of Sri Guru and Gauranga. If we are constantly inspired by the duty of discoursing about the truth under the guidance of Sri Guru, no hankering after traveling, nor any veiled form of desire other than chanting of Harinam will ever strike any terrors into our hearts. Mm. Fearlessness. This vowed service of the name, the transcendental abode, and the desire of Sri Gaurasundar is our only eternal function. We are bhikshus of the triple staff. The ingathering of the smallest arms, even such as are gathered by the bees, is our only means for serving the manifestation of the manifestive divine form of Sri Chaitanya Mat all over the world. We are neither enjoyers nor abnegators of mundane entities. We recognize as our highest objective the desire for carrying with veneration the shoes of the order of the Paramhamsas. It will be our only duty to proclaim to all the people that complete reliance on the transcendental absolute truth is by far the highest form of freedom and one that is infinitely superior to the partial independent mastery over the distorted, reflected entity in the shape of this mundane world. By holding the straw between our teeth in supplication, we shall carry aloft the banner of that real freedom to all persons. We should be constantly engaged in chanting the exhilarating name of Sri Hari, by adopting as our fundamental enlightening principle that the highest path is the path of submission, endorsed by Sri Rupa, with the further exhortation to cherish the unwavering faith that he will always protect us. What an inspiring speech. Imagine the scene, the magnificently romantic spiritual figure of Sri Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, the commander-in-chief of the Vaishnavas, exhorting his men to carry the transcendental sound into the heart of darkness, the Western world, reminding them that their only duty is to serve the master with perfect sincerity, reminding them that they are not the doers, but simply the instruments, the living mridangas of Sri Chaitanya giving forth our music at the lotus feet of Sri Guru. He is reminding them to remain humble, that all persons of this world are really superior to us in every way as far as the world is concerned. 
he also reminds them that we have not been actuated by any attempt of rivalry or hostility in undertaking this propaganda. And finally, it will be our duty to proclaim to all the people that complete reliance on the transcendental absolute truth is by far the highest form of freedom. We shall carry aloft the banner of real freedom to all persons. This speech shows perfect realization of the preaching spirit in the mood of the perfect humility of a Vaishnava. Wow. Compare this mood of perfect humility to Srila Prabhupada's prayers invoking Srila Saraswati Thakur's mercy composed on the Jaladuta on his journey to America. Shri Srimad Bhaktisattva... Uh, one second, I, I was thinking that because uh, that is the mood that Srila Prabhupada carried here and I was thinking if they would quote that prayer following this description and that is there in the in the in the writing i cannot see yeah, anything coming yeah, yeah go ahead go ahead go ahead shri shrimad bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur who is very dear to lord goranga the mother the son of mother shachi is unparalleled in his service to the supreme lord sri krishna he is that very he is that great saintly spiritual master who bestows intense devotion to Krishna at different places throughout the world. By his strong desire, the holy name of Lord Gauranga will spread throughout all the countries of the Western world. In all the cities, towns and villages on the earth, from all the oceans, seas, rivers and streams, everyone will chant the holy name of Krishna. As the vast mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu conquers all directions, a flood of transcendental ecstasy will certainly cover the land. When all the sinful, miserable living entities become happy, the Vaishnava's desire is then fulfilled. Although my Guru Maharaj ordered me to do it, I am not worthy or fit to do it. I am very fallen and insignificant. Therefore, O oh Lord, now I am begging you for your mercy, so that I may become worthy for, for you are the wisest and most experienced of all. If you bestow your power by serving the spiritual master, one attains the absolute truth. One's life becomes successful. If this service is obtained, then one becomes happy and gets your association due to good fortune. And then, arriving in Boston, he speaks out his heart to Lord Krishna. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this useless soul that I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me, but I guess you, might, you have some business here. Otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? Most of the population here is covered by the material modes of ignorance and passion. Absorbed in material life, they think themselves very happy and satisfied, and therefore they have no taste for the transcendental message of Vasudeva. I do not know how they will be able to understand it, but I know your causeless mercy can make everything possible because you are the most expert mystic. How will they understand the mellows of devotional service? O oh Lord, I am simply praying for your mercy so that I will be able to convince them about your message. All living entities have come under the control of the illusory energy by your will. And therefore, if you like, by your will, they can also be released from the clutches of illusion. I wish that you may deliver them. Therefore, if you, if you so desire their deliverance, then only will they be able to understand your message. The words of Srimad Bhagavatam are your incarnation. And if a sober person repeatedly receives it with submissive oral reception, then he will be able to understand your message. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2 Point seventeen to 21. Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma, super soul in everyone's heart and the benefactor of the truthful devotee, 
cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who relishes his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. By regularly hearing the Bhagavatam and by rendering service unto the pure devotee, all that is troublesome in the heart is practically destroyed. And loving service unto the glorious Lord, who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable, irrevocable fact. At the time, loving service is established in the heart, the modes of passion, rajas, and ignorance, tamas, and lust and desire, kama, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness, and he becomes happy. Thus established in the mode of goodness, the man rejuvenated by loving service to the Lord gains liberation from material association, mukti, and comes to know scientifically of the personality of Godhead. Thus the knots of the heart and all misgivings are cut to pieces. The chain of fruitive actions, karma, is terminated when one sees the self as master. He will become liberated from the influence of the modes of ignorance and passion. And thus all inauspicious things accumulated in the core of the heart will disappear. How will I make them understand the message of Krishna consciousness? I am very unfortunate, unqualified and the most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. Somehow or other, O Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure as you like. O spiritual master of all the worlds, I can simply repeat your message. So if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. It's beautiful. Only by your causeless mercy will my words become pure. I'm sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel engladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. O oh Lord, I'm just like a puppet in your hands. So if you have brought me here, to dance, then make me dance. Make me dance, O Lord. Make me dance as you like. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I have been designated as, as Bhakti Vedanta, and now, if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhakti Vedanta. So powerful. Uh, one second, Mataji. We're at 43. Okay. One, two more paragraphs. Okay. Let's finish this one. Yeah. Comparing this powerful invocation for the mercy of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and Lord Krishna with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's La Envoy, we see that His Divine Grace, Isi Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Prabhupada's mood, words, and activity were the living personification of the preacher as described by his spiritual master. We can see that Srila Prabhupada was clearly the full manifestation of the intense desires of Srila Saraswati Thakur to spread Krishna consciousness in the Western world, as he was consumed with the same intense compassion and humility to deliver the unfortunate. These two liberated, empowered preachers were clearly Krishna's choice for the salvation of the earth. In May, a preaching center was established in London at Kensington. At the end of the month, Srila Saraswati Thakur received some inquiries from Lord Zetland, who had formerly been the governor of Bengal during Srila Prabhupada's student days. And he also heard from the Marquis of Ludian. He sent them replies. In June, he received letters of thanks and appreciation from the secretary of Lord Irwin, the Marquis of Ludian, the editor of the London Times, and Sir Stanley Jackson. His preachers then had a meeting in July with King George V, 
and Queen Mary at Buckingham Palace, and also with the Archbishop of Canterbury. By December, his European preachers had proceeded to Germany and France and delivered some lectures there. Mm. Oh, I, ju I just just wanted to ask Vamsi Dari Prabhu, do you um, see the, which year was that and how old was Srila Bhakti Siddhanta at that time when he started sending the uh, disciples for Western preaching? Yes, yeah, sure, Mataji. So I also wanted to see that. So it was in 1933. Uh, yeah, he sent them in 1933. And yes. he had rented in 1874. So 33 plus 36. 36. Six, 69. 69 years he was when he no, sent them. One second. 74 means 26. 26 plus 33, 59. 59, yeah, 59 59 years and you know even uh, it's interesting when he told Srila Prabhupada to come and preach in the west and it took so many years for Srila Prabhupada to come here and so when he was 59 he had already sent all these people and uh, yeah, with a clear clear uh, instruction how to preach how to preach and Srila Prabhupada comes completely following those instructions and he executes it perfectly, you know, after so many years later. Yeah. Amazing. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 59. How long, how many years did he, did Bhakti Siddhanta live? That was 59 years. I he think sent. only three more years. Uh, 62. Uh, it, it looks like he left in one second. He left in 1936. Uh, his contribution summarized. Uh, we will find it out, Mataji. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. I think earlier... I think I will Google... Hmm. Oh, Sarah Graham at this end. Okay, nobody signed up. Okay. But the Siddhanta Sarswat Thakur. It's from 1874 to 1937. Uh, so four more years. That's all. 62. Total 62 mm. years. Mm. Yeah, 59. Mm. 62. Wow. Okay. Mm. Okay, we came to our favorite section. Favorite um favorite part. Going to Mohini Mataji, you need to share. Yeah, Prabhu, I've been just uh, hearing. Um <laughs> Yeah, that's the reason. I've been running errands, but this has been so nice. The last section that um, Chintamani Mataji read, like, you know, Prabhupada's this, um, prayers that he offers at that, uh, you know, Boston Pier, like, you know, you can hear again and again. And yeah. like she said, like, it's, they're so powerful and you can really feel how uh, Mataji was sharing, like, you know, his compassion and his uh, wanting to give this Krishna consciousness. So, um, you know, my thoughts were going that we forget that, like, because we get so busy, like, you know, we get busy in our lives. So to yeah. hear these prayers and to remember Srila Prabhupada's sacrifices is, um, you know, it's, it's important to yeah. not take, you know, not take these teachings that, you know, he has given and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati has given for granted because that, um, you know, it can happen where we take, like, yeah, we know it, you know, we take their teachings for granted. So, you should open a yeah. preaching center. Mm -hmm. Each householder should open a preaching center. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not how I many, it's not just householder, you know, each member. Each member, yeah. yeah. So thank you, yeah, bro. 
Okay, Chintamani Matas, you are unmuted. Um, I don't know. I mean, this last part was so emotional, actually. And I was thinking, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, the, the, his uh, disciples that he sent to Europe, he actually, uh, he physically, I mean, he empowered everybody, but then he actually did so much to empower them by writing mm. to Buckingham yeah. this and this, that, and, you know, I mean, and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Chakra, I mean, already by everything that we've read, is such a towering <laughs> superhuman personality. And he mm. himself did so many like things. Power. Yeah. Um, and looks like, I mean, some success was uh, actually achieved, but um, our Shriya Prabhupada, I mean, just by his humility and complete surrender to the holy name and the way he's, you know, the mood that he came in, and he just <laughs> flooded the Americas. <laughs> with it did happen, the yeah. whole world. Yeah. Yeah, it's so wonderful. Also, you know, when we um, read about uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's erudition, his scholastic um, abilities, I mean, the ability to speak to all these professors and everybody and talk about just anything and everything. And he hadn't gone to college either. I mean, I, I, know, I know that he, while he was working at the Agartala um, Royal, the king yeah. yeah. was, was, he was, looking after the library. He was the yes. librarian there. And that's when uh, I think Samira had read. That's how he kind of just read up and, you know, gained all this knowledge. Um, but at the end of the day, his intent, and this was, um, I think, around page 60, 68, some, something. Um, he was... I mean, many people, you know, I mean, he went after so many, The I mean, he did so many things, setting up dioramas, I mean, the, mm. this, that, the preaching centers, he went to presidents and governors and all that, Indian kings and encouraging them. And the Indian, I mean, some of the nationalists and priests were, purists were frowning upon him. But Srila Saraswati Thakur was far removed from the bodily concept of life. His idea was to, Involve and purify everyone in the flood of the Sankirtan movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yes. I mean, <laughs> you see all these things, and it almost seems material, you know, all these yeah. other things, yeah. and so powerfully and great, you know. But this is what he had in his heart was to yeah. involve and purify everyone in the flood of the Sankirtan movement of Sri Chaitanya That's Mahaprabhu. It. It's just so amazing, my goodness. They made it happen. <laughs> made it. The disciple and guru made it. <laughs> yeah. And we are somehow, some good fortune, <laughs> able to relish and somehow have the path in front of, I mean, especially for me. <laughs> it's all of your natural humility much. <laughs> but Bhakti Siddhanta's uh, preaching techniques uh, with uh, dioramas and uh, contacting all kinds of personalities, uh, opening various uh, preaching centers and everything. He he was full of ideas and um, he was born he was born to preach. You can yeah. see that, you know. He was born to preach, he was born to lead, and mm. uh, his leadership was such he was super organized. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess at the time when Gaudiya mud spread all over India and they have even a branch in Madras and I mentioned uh, we read somewhere that he all the way to Udupi and mm -hmm. it's not like in South India at that time you know South India has its own Vaishnava traditions you know but uh, the Gaudiya tradition going to South India and taking strong mm -hmm. root at that time when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was alive uh, the Gaudiya Mat was also very strong at that time, uh, in in even in South India. And uh, but in course of time, when the Mat collapsed, and uh, you know everything was just barely existing afterwards. And you know it's such a 
I mean, he it, it, it's 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 a it's not something that we can even imagine. You know, a guru like him, you know, a simha guru, you know, who was so empowered and he established everything and. And before he left, he could see mm. cracks, cracks appearing and uh, people fighting among themselves. And that and all will come later. But, you know, Srila Prabhupada establishing GBC to oversee this con and, you know, it, it, it now spread. It's not just in India. It is now all over the world and with so much of diversity and Maintaining this institution without people killing each other, you know, it's, it is amazing. You know, on the one side, you see the world with politics and so many people involved in, you know, philanthropic activities and, you know, socialism and you name it. All of that is always there. And along with that, there is the spreading of Krishna consciousness, which is going on by the work of Acharyas like Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and Srila Prabhupada, someone like that traveling, you know, he it's interesting that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta didn't leave India. Imagine how it would have been if he had gone to England and you know, just <laughs> that that's uh, Professor Sutter's conversation, which turned everything upside down. Imagine that he 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 giving a class like that to a big assembly of westerners but you know uh, he 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 laid the foundation he sent the people he he had this disciple Srila Prabhupada who was here to complete his mission of yeah. this preaching and and then we have this institution which is diverse and people with all kinds of uh, uh, you know there is so much of diversity but we talk about unity in diversity but it takes a lot of a ton of organization and a ton of uh, uh, people working together to keep this thing together. It is not an easy task. It yeah, there's like 11 or 13 sannyasis, something like that. No, it's what, what did you say about taking sannyas? Yeah, there's like 11 or 13 sannyasis for all the organization. 11 or 13 sannyasis uh, for the Gaudiya Mat? Yeah, when he that's what mentioned is the when he was organizing. Yeah, the, so that the, I remember reading that there was uh, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta did not want uh, anyone one person to be leading that organization, but uh, there was a very strong preacher Brahmachari who everybody kind of nominated and his leadership failed because he fell for a woman and all that and afterwards all the sannyasis for opened up various madhas and it became a big confusion. But what I'm saying is now, you know, imagine, you know, this scorn came out of that, uh, yeah. that ashes of Gaudiya mud, right? Gaudiya mud still exists in namesake. It is still existing, but it's really collapsed. It's just, when we read about uh, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta's preaching techniques and how much he envisioned from that i mean that energy what he had is the he had the organization he had the knowledge he had the ability to empower people and send them in different walks of life whether in india or outside of india and it flourished like anything and then it collapsed and then out of the ashes came iskon and now iskon is like a totally all over the world and so much of diversity and still to bring it, I mean, to keep it all together, it's a heavy job for the disciples of Srila Prabhupada. And um, it, it is an amazing moment. It's only 50 years and there is so much more to happen. This is very beginning, but it is not an easy thing either. You know, th that, is, th that is really, when you read about uh, Bhakti Siddhanta's history and his teaching, you see how much of it Srila Prabhupada carried out and you see, you know, always you see failures. You can see from failures, uh, something good comes. Yeah. Um, even in Bhagavadam, you can see like uh, some failure, uh, some some mishap happens in the life of somebody, somebody and then something else good comes out of it. You see yeah. that in the life of many personalities. And I guess that, that's the way. That's the way of life. 
but and... we we somehow we somehow are part of this organization and we are extremely fortunate at least we have something worthwhile to meditate upon you know yeah. it's, okay. it's our good fortune i feel that way thank yes. you yeah. hari krishna yes and the so true mother ji instead of wasting time in so many other things around the world that that's there to distract and yeah yeah sorry okay mother ji sun prabhu ji so we will come back we are in the last three chapters so we'll hear next three years of expedition and then final days and final contribution summarized yeah, there is more chapters this... in this now There is only three more chapters here in this book. Yeah, three more chapters, but there is lot of appendix. It constitutes the whole half of you know we are almost like half the way through this book, Madhuri. Interesting. Very good. Yeah, there are appendix in a concluding portion. I mean, uh, some articles by Marshala Prabhupa and from lectures and appreciation of Bhakti Dhan Saraswati Pur and so on. I have this book, but I didn't go looking for it because you are showing it on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we will read today and Friday. I think uh, Friday also we can read. I may I will not be there. I think maybe Chinta Mani Mataji could be able to prepare to facilitate the call on Friday evening. But isn't Maharaj here uh, on Friday? Yeah, he's here. He's doing a college program, Mataji. So. Oh. we can uh, we can uh, why can't we just do it when uh, monday when, uh, yeah uh, when, when you are available we can just uh, you can just send the calendar out like you know those days when maharaj is giving classes if there is an evening class those days we cannot do this right yeah. so if you, so you can send it that during his presence mm-hmm. you know we will pause the reading and then continue when he it is only friday on friday also actually is a college program not a home program but um, you may have to go hmm? oh he is going to northwestern where, where is he no, going it's a, it's a du page thing du page thing uh, who is taking me uh, am in a given a problem i'll be driving i'll be going but uh, but the rest of the community is free so you know maybe there is someone to facilitate the call with the reading and continue i don't know how to do these kind of things mm. okay then i will send a message we'll resume from uh, monday onwards i will skip tomorrow and day after my then what is what? tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow is what thursday tomorrow, tomorrow is Mar- thursday maharaj Mar- will be here returning ah uh? maharaj